Okay, mics are live. Just want to make that clear. No, end, end of oral communication. I'll try to remember before the end of the year, but. Thank you. Drive back up with that so I don't confuse Welcome okay, you take it. to the SoCal Creek Water District meeting for today, November 19th, 2019. It's a good day. Um, roll call will find all of our board members present, and we have no public hearing. So the first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I would like to pull and get to my notes here. Uh, the minutes of November 5th, I think it's 3.1.1. Okay. Oh, point two. 3.1.2. 3.1.2, okay. And that's it. Okay. And nothing else? All right. Any motion to? So moved. I'll move second. To move the uh, other rest of the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. None. So motion carries. And then you wanted to look at the minutes for. I think there's a typo. Good. Go ahead. Did <laughs> you find it? I was not looking at that. Oh. But get, um, let me get to the history of business. It was on the ADUs. What page? Um, <clears throat> I guess it would be on page four of six of the minutes, which is nine of 100. Okay. And I'd just like it uh, to be noted in the, the comments on the, in the minutes that uh, I supported the smaller ADUs, but voted against it because concerned about um, not a limit on the ADU size. And I thought it was an issue of fairness. Okay. And did you have something to? No, I think I decided it wasn't a typo. I was okay. confused when I read what my um, what the motion was, but I think it's right. Okay. So I'll make the motion to approve. I will okay. second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. So, thank you. And so the next item is our oral and written communication. So this is be the time for the public to address the board on any item not on tonight's agenda. Seeing none, we'll move on to some board comments and then maybe any any board. Well, actually, can we just start with a little announcement for Ron? Yeah, well, it's a, a press release. I can read it now or after the board speaks. This okay. is a good time. Yeah, so this is a press release that went out uh, on Friday, and I'm just going to read it. I think it's a well-done press release. So on November 15th, Friday, Superior Court Judge Timothy Schmall in Santa Cruz County ruled in favor of the Soquel Creek Water District on all elements of a legal action brought against the district earlier this year. The legal action alleged insufficiencies in the Environmental Impact Report, or EIR, for the Pure Water SoCal Groundwater Replenishment and Seawater Intrusion Prevention Project. The district's board of directors certified the AR, EIR and approved the project on December 18, 2018. Judge Small wrote a well-reasoned 17-page point-by-point decision which denied the petitioner's request writ of mandate, which is a court order to a government agency to correct any agency's prior actions. is a quote. We're very happy that we can continue to move forward in our efforts to protect our groundwater supply from seawater intrusion, providing a safe, reliable, drought-resistant water supply for future generations, said Dr. Tom LeHue, president of the district's board of directors. The dis judge's decision clearly showed that our environmental impact report, or the EIR, was thorough, compliant with the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, and protective of the environment. 
The lawsuit challenged the district certification of the EIR and approval of the project under CEQA on a number of points, some of which were procedural in nature, those being the district's public noticing, the time limit for the EIR public comment period, and notifying of appropriate agency, agencies. The judge notes that the district was in fact compliant in all those instances. Among several others, two, the two primary challenges in the lawsuit centered on whether the district <coughs> adequately, adequately analyzed the protective, I mean the project alternative of water transfers only, and whether the district provided meaningful analysis of impacts on water quality as a result of the project. The court found that the district did in fact comply with the requirements of CEQA in conducting its alternative analysis including water transfers only, and that there was adequate analysis of groundwater quality with conclusions of these issues, supported by substantial evidence. The judge found all other assertions made by the petitioner in the lawsuit similarly insufficient. In short, the judge ruled that the district's EIR and the certification slash adoption process were compliant with CEQA. Period. Thank you. Great. So good news on Friday, and then more good news today. And I'm going to read actually just a portion of the press release that actually came out just today from the state water board, since we were just there. Um, seeking to clean up and prevent contamination of aquifers that supply millions of Californians with drinking water, the state water resources control board announced today that it has approved the last th of 13 grants totaling 367 million dollars awarded since july this funding has filled a huge need to bolster groundwater cleanup efforts in numerous key areas said um, joaquin esquivel chair of the state water board the projects implemented under this program will support the state's water resiliency and sustainability efforts by encouraging protection restoration and utilization of valuable local water resources the State Water Board today approved $86 million in funding for the Soquel Creek Water District's Pure Water Soquel Groundwater Replenishment and Seawater Intrusion Prevention Project. The, pro the funding includes $50 million in grants and a $36 million low interest loan. The project is intended to address severe groundwater overdraft in the area and to combat seawater intrusion that has been detected in the underlying aquifer. So I'm not gonna read the rest, but um, I will say that I am honored and I was very proud of our district and our customers that came up there today um, and all of the and our staff uh, and our yeah, yeah our staff is amazing and so I want to just mention that all of the state board members said something positive about our project that it's a showcase that it's a model for the rest of the state that it's exactly what the state wants to be doing and needs to be doing for resiliency in the long term. And I, I think um, obviously this is gonna make it much better for our customers, but I wanna just also, the staff put in a huge amount of effort and I wanna, Melanie, I wanna just point you out a little bit for spearheading an incredible effort to get this done and never giving up. And just, I mean, when we are, producing water at the end of 2022, you need to take the first sip. <laughs> okay. So I, <laughs> anyway, I'll, that'll be enough for me. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other? Um, I know how hard it is, and this is probably five times bigger than what I had to do, and I totally knew you guys had it. I was already planning. <laughs> <laughs> I never once doubted you, and I'm so proud. Thank you for all your work. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll move on. Can we just, um, oh, wait, for, forgot. Yeah. Well, Let's celebrate. And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize those that um, came up today. Oh, yeah. So um, the item was on the State Water Resources Control Board uh, agenda this morning so we did go up to Sacramento and many of our um, project 
supporters as well as partners um, also attended and I just wanted to take the time to recognize them and l let me know if I um, forget anybody. But in this picture here, um, I just wanted to kind of call out that uh, in the back behind the dais are the State Water Resources Control Board um, members. We had uh, Laurel Firestone, uh, Director T uh, Talk, is that how you say talk? Tam Dudak, um, uh, uh, help Walkie, me, Walkie 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 Walkie. Uh -huh. um, uh, Vice Chair, let me see if the names are right here, sorry, I should have done this, oh, I don't have it, um, Doreen, and then um, uh, Sean McGuire, along with those that spoke on behalf of the district, we had Larry Freeman there, who is here in the audience tonight, speaking on behalf of ratepayers, uh, Robert Singleton from the Santa Cruz County Business Council. We also had uh, Toby Briggs from Friends of the River. We had Sierra Ryan who spoke on behalf of um, the uh, Santa Cruz City uh, Water Commission and also as uh, a staff who assists with the MGA. And we also had Mark Dettel who spoke on behalf of being the uh, Public Works Director for the City of Santa Cruz. We also uh, just want to recognize also in the picture that um, we did have other uh, Pure Water SoCal team members as well as staff from the Division of Financial Assistance. So um, it really was a team effort. In addition to those who spoke, there were over 100 letters that were submitted to the state. So, um, you know, a, a shout out to our community who really prioritize the environment as well as our customers. Uh, rates, you know, we've been hearing that from people, and this is what this is all about: is to ensure a seawater intrusion prevention project, as well as being mindful and respectful of of our ratepayers and where we can get funding assistance. Mm. We want to get that. So, with that, Ron, did you want to say anything? I think you did an excellent job. I think it's time to toast. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> if we could have anybody in the audience who would like to join us in a toast of uh, preventing seawater intrusion to the groundwater basin and also uh, you know, making our, uh, our water affordable and reducing uh, local ratepayer costs by getting grants and loans, um, I'd like you to come up, please. Oh yes, just we're toasting with apple cider. <laughs> <laughs> Just so we know. And soft apple flavor as well. Sure. Local. Yeah. Okay, we got every, let me know. I think everybody can just come right up front and get their glass. Don't be bashful. Right? All right. <laughs> We're good. Can we get in front? It's okay. We don't need so to be seen. You guys can go up there. I want to toast to <laughs> our customers, to our staff, to all of the people on the board and all of the people who will benefit from a safe water supply in the future. And the environment. And the environment. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Great. So nice job and thank you so much. Great job. Thank you, Ron. I guess I dodged it. Oh, very sweet. <laughs> Best, cider. Best cider I've ever had. Awesome. Melanie, good job. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's local. Local cider. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so thank you, everybody. Um, uh, the next item on the agenda is the management update. have any uh, additions to the conservation customer service field report but if you have any questions we'd be happy to answer them sure Carl um, I just, have a, uh, just a couple of uh, just one or two customers just in passing come to me and ask about the accuracy of new meters that you, and so I thought well maybe the meter that you had before was inaccurate and yeah I couldn't understand what was going on uh, it was beyond me to figure that out or whether they had a leak or uh, so that they just had unexpected water use after um, 
Sure. Is this um, in relation to the AMI upgrade? That's or? what they thought. Okay. Of course, so it's hard to. Hmm. No. Yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, basically over watering going on as we were in the irrigation season and moving out and um, a lot of people were surprised by their high bills because they were their timers <laughs> were set to irrigate quite frequently and so we have had people say well there's you know no way I could have used that much water there must be something wrong with the meter and uh, you know we were able to data log in most cases and pull the um, hourly consumption from those meters and basically show customers when that happened when that water went through the meter yeah That's so really, really um, and then helpful. as far as the AMI upgrade goes for the majority of services I'd say like 95% of the services are only having a register replacement as opposed to a whole meter replacement and so there should not be really any change in in the reading on that meter and Typically, if you have an older meter, that's when they start to lose performance and they read on the low side. Um, so, you know, if you were to put a newer meter in there, it might be more more accurate and therefore record a higher consumption. But but I'll I'll add if you have a, a specific name or number, we're always willing to, to meet with them. I was at a loss as to how the because like I wasn't even sure how many of the newer register the new registers have been put in or anything and they you know it's like what <laughs> they didn't know either but if I knew more about the map you know the map of installation oh, okay. where they've yeah. been done we can uh, we can always go out and do a customer service call and uh, take a look at things and make sure that the meters basically. Okay. You know the reg the correct register has been installed uh, for that size meter. Check the programming, make sure everything's correct. Um, work with the customer and show them what the data log says about when they use the water. And then, you know, of course, Waterwise house calls are always available to people for free okay. for more detailed help. I was going to suggest the one thing that happens because we've had two big power outages is mm -hmm. that sometimes these systems, when they're out of power, they reset and they reset to 30 minutes for each cycle, yes. and that can use oh, a whole lot of water. Yeah, we've true. been outreaching that. I think mm -hmm. in the last couple monthly e-blasts, we've been trying to really let people know, you know, after maybe the power some people outages. don't know about that still, and mm -hmm. yeah, I can see that suffering point. from that. That's a great possibility. That's why I didn't. Uh, um, decided to wait till I had a chance to ask about it before I just plowed into it. Um, you know, sometimes it's just, just simply a leak. If they had a leak in mm -hmm. the it just happen. So uh, we've been um, finding quite a few uh, cases where people are, have left hoses on, <laughs> and we've, with our new AMI technology, as we've rolled that out, we've been able to let people know, like within a day or two, your leak your hose is on or your hose was left on um so we've had a couple people say thank you so much for letting us know and go out and turn it off so that's been great that's more of what i expected i think it's like oh, i suddenly used too much water what happened <laughs> hey bruce so this might not be a question you can answer i'm not sure but on social media i've been told that there's people talking about higher bills because the billing cycles have changed that some things have been clumped together differently with the, is that? I'm not, I haven't Nothing heard related that, to I'm not sure. No, we'll check into that, but I don't think we changed that, so okay. still monthly. Yeah, I think our billing cycle should be the same. I would think it would, but. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. If it was, it would be a one-time change if we were to change. I was it. wondering if there's something strange with, with meters being used or something of that nature. Okay. I'll look into it though. Um, okay. I had one more question about AMI. Um, when will the Harmony software and the access for people to look at their own water use sure. be available? So we have um, access to Master Meter, that's the AMI vendor, to their portal called My Water Advisor. And we recently went back and took another close look at that um, with Master Meter. And um, there's a couple things associated with the program that we feel don't really uh, meet our needs and our customers needs and so 
Um, one example would be um, per email login, that email customer can only look at one account through the portal. And so you have to have a different email for each account. And so that is somewhat of a limitation that Master Meter said they're working on, their software development and trying to fix. Um, another um, kind of issue that uh, concerns us is they do a comparative consumption by month and they look at the, ha the particular account as compared to um, all of the accounts in the district divided like an average and so that includes um, uh, commercial use uh -huh. and irrigation use and that just sends the wrong message and so um, I think what we want to do is go back and look at some other products and see if those best meet our needs. And so we'll be coming back to the board, I'm sure, with more details on that. Um, kind of a uh, one thing that, um, you know, we don't want to just roll out something and then have it not work. Um, we were talking with another local agency that's doing AMI and they tried to use the manufacturer's portal because it was free. and they rolled it out and they found that you know it didn't meet their needs there were issues with it and so then they pulled it and they started using water smart and um, it's confused people because now they have to go in and create a second login to use the portal and and some other concerns and so we want to roll out something that uh, is okay. good from the start and not have any confusion and issues and you know, provide the best service to our customers, so. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. I was thinking Master Meter kind of touted that as a, one of the advantages to their system and yeah, so a little and bit misrepresenting it if it's not an effective Yeah, I think um, there's some, some good things with their product um, compared to some of the other man meter manufacturers' products. Um, in fact, they did work with um, WaterSmart on some of the graphics, which are really nice, but it's just those details on how they put together their metrics and so I you'll be checking back with them and also looking at alternatives and coming back to us yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. okay so I just want to say that I've been approached by members of the community who have volunteered to be beta testers and okay great there's the rollout but there might be beta something tests. beforehand because Good time. you you I'm sure we'll find other things that gotcha. are wrong with software et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So, good. Yeah, and so um, we'll definitely reach out to you, and when we get closer, and see if we can collect that contact yeah, I, information. I'll beta test. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I will too, of course. <laughs> if I'm, I'm there. But the, I think it would be wise instead of having a, a total rollout to have a yeah. beta test, and you're probably planning mm -hmm. that anyway. Yeah, and we, you know, we've worked with WaterSmart in the past, so um, they. I think a, a company that provides a portal is going to provide also um, more services in terms of the rollout and the outreach to customers and things of that nature than we would we would be doing that at a staff right. level if we go with the master meter product. So I just think it might be a smoother transition and and startup. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other things for our uh, um, conservation? All right. Engineering. Well, pardon me for not being able to get you a written report. It was a busy week. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just give you a couple updates. Uh, Bryce Dahlmeyer, our associate engineer, is, has routed plans uh, around internally for the Soquel Drive main replacement project. Uh, to refresh your memory, that's from Cabrillo to State Park. And so we're hoping to roll that out early next year. Uh, Mike Wilson, our other associate engineer, is also wrapping up the Granite Way Well project at the corner of Cathedral and Trout Gulch. Um, Thursday, we're anticipating the pump to be installed. It's been a long process for that. Uh, and then we got word from PG&E that we won't get our electric service for another month. But between now and then, uh, of course, the well pump will be installed. The coating uh, will be applied on the above ground piping and then the site can get paved. So there's still some work that can be done, but we anticipate by early next year we'll be operating that well. Um, and then I've been involved in all the procurement uh, steps for Pure Water Soquel. 
Um, the one that's been making its way further along is the uh, conveyance pipeline um, effort. And also I've been involved in the uh, treatment um, teams that have been uh, interviewing with our, our team as well. And so that's, that's moving along and we anticipate bringing you some actionable items early next year in January for the conveyance. Okay. Any questions? Questions from Jay? Okay. okay. Uh, I did, I oh did have a question. The recycled water tertiary treatment plant in Santa Cruz, is that moving along in, in, in parallel or? Yes, that was, that was the other part of the procurement that we've been working on is interviewing okay. design teams design build teams to do both uh, it's a package for both tertiary and advanced okay so yes yeah okay operations and maintenance public comment will be after the management report is done um, the only thing I have to add is I'm sure you've all heard uh, last night uh, PG&E called another <coughs> public safety power shut off and we were notified that 27 of our, of our facilities would lose power Sometime tomorrow, and then about 1.30 today, they actually canceled it for us in all of Santa Cruz County. So another good piece of good news today. So. Mm -hmm. Anything on questions for O&M? I have, I have a, actually a question that came up uh, at that summit I went to last two weeks ago, uh, around October 30th, uh, October 3rd. And it was about uh, one of the talks at the summit was about fire preparedness and I just wondered if had you know this is this uh, the plan shutdowns came on kind of suddenly and I just wondered if you'd ever had a chance to to plan you know have a real emergency approach if there was an actual fire and whether that's been done here in the district if there is a, a an actual fire yeah, um, because we're in a in that fire interface I guess you Right. Um, well, the district itself hasn't been doing any fire response emergency preparedness, but we, um, our emergency preparedness focuses on basically keeping the water running and the, um, you know, the water to the hydrants that are going to be fighting the fires. Um. Yeah, I think one of the, well, the speaker is Dave Peterson from down in California. Mm -hmm. It was one of the fires, I think. When was that? Um, but in any case, it was adjoining their district, but they were engulfed near the, they were near the fire, okay. and they regretted extremely they didn't have an emergency, you know, an off-site emergency operations center, because mm. they had been, they were required to uh, shelter on-site at their water district. Mm -hmm. All of the entire employ, the entire staff was stuck in this thing, and the only thing that um, brought it out is that some battalion chief was fighting fires in the forest there. <laughs> Uh, drove up through the smoke and they were just looking out their glass glass doors and uh, they said hey, do you want to save this building and they went yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> why not <laughs> no they didn't say that they said yes and um, so they saved it but they realized that they didn't have they hadn't that was one thing they hadn't actually prepared for was the site their own building might you know prevent you know prevent emergency response mm -hmm. And so there were a couple other things, but that you know, in particular, I thought, well, this is probably a good idea because we are in, we haven't had a fire like that, but we are in, as these shutdowns show us, that we are in a fire-prone area. Well, we have been doing um, some defensible space clearing at some of our sites, where, um, uh, uh, which was, it's triggered also by, by our sanitary survey and then also we had an arborist go to every single one of our sites a couple of months ago, and yesterday we um, uh, took some contractors around to give us bids on um, addressing those trees and some more defensible space around our, our facilities. So we're, we will be proceeding with that and probably taking that um, to the board in the next month or so. Great. Okay. I'll, I'll, since we're talking about emergency preparedness, at one point, and I don't remember how many years ago it was, there was talk about what if there was an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it, you know, no rush on this, but I think it'd be good to refresh the, because some of the board members weren't here at that time, you know, refresh the board on what, what the plans are and if there are any, 
any gaps, things that need to be taken care of? Sure, yeah, we have an emergency response plan that's updated as necessary. Um, and I can bring that, some more information about that. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Special projects. <laughs> Nothing to <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I don't have much to um, say other than what we said at Oral Common, except just that the uh, special projects outreach team is also assisting other departments on some of the outreach that's underway right now. We are still assisting for the water transfer. When that becomes available, we were gearing up for that um, early November, and we're you know we'll be assisting as needed once that valve is open, once the rain comes, and and the city says yes. Uh, we're also assisting with engineering on some other outreach, and uh, we are still focusing on um, the youth outreach and education. Uh, Becca and I continue to work with some partners that are taking over some of the outreach to the schools and um, assemblies, and we are also starting to evaluate what we're going to be doing in the next fiscal year. Vi was so instrumental. Uh, we just had a car ride with Sierra Ryan, and she was just talking about the Water Conservation Coalition, mm -hmm. and they as well are kind of going through um, identifying the needs. Um, there's a, a big shoes to fill um, on many of the aspects, so we're focusing a lot on that as well. And then, just as Taj mentioned, we are going forward with some of the procurement for the Pure Water SoCal project. Are there Great. any questions? Well, I have. I just want to comment of you. It would be great to get an update on that sometime in the near future. What's happening with procurement? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Melanie. All right. Um, finance. I need to do finance. Uh, I can do it. Yeah. No, yeah. for finance. Finance. I don't know if she had anything. I don't have anything. N nothing there to report. Uh, she's still out, uh, but if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them, but uh, yeah. nothing to report out at this time. Okay. And I'm Thank just you, here to answer any additional questions you might have on our report. I don't want to take up too much time. Got We're me. good? All right. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and general manager. Yeah, I'll just say uh, when we were up in Sacramento, one of the things that struck me, we met with one of the environmental organizations, and they talked about you know, why they supported our project and that sort of thing. But what struck me is they talked about how they've been always kind of focused kind of on the negative and, and defensive against things and that sort of thing. And, and that's common of a lot of environmental organizations, you know, some of the ones I belong to. But what they've tried to do is take a, uh, what they call a point positive. And that's when you're going down a river, you don't point to the way not to go, but the way to go. So, you know, it's very clear. You don't want to head toward the to the rapid that's going to take you out, you, you know, and so that's what they do. And so they've shifted their thinking and uh, approach to try to be kind of proactive and take a, a positive uh, approach instead of always a negative. And I think they're starting to see results with that. So that was, um, was kind of heartening to see that. Can and I add a, uh, just, just a note? Because yeah. one of the, the speaker from Friends of the River, when she was talking, started her comments to the state water board was like, I know it's not common for us to be up here, you know, Promoting. supporting water infrastructure because a lot of times they're fighting dams and things mm -hmm. that are affecting rivers. But this is the kind of project we want to support that's that's going to protect our rivers and increase groundwater and increase flows into the stream. So that was really kind of cool to see that focus on positive. You know, yeah, spoke from the heart. And so with that positive, you know. I was thinking I have 86 reasons to be very grateful today, and actually it's 86 million reasons to be grateful <laughs> today to the state board and their staff. And I think, you know, I know that y'all don't get recognized, but what I saw up there today was true professionalism at the state board level, the staff, and so just an expression here and now of gratitude to them for watching out for our water supply flooding, all that they do, the, the funding, the whole bit. They've got a big task, and I, I know they're they're dedicated and they care. That's that's fair. That was uh, came through loud and clear. So just a shout out to them. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see. No other management reports. So now would be a time if anybody wanted to make comment to the board on that item only.
Good evening, Becky Steinbrunner. I was late in arriving. The traffic out there is pretty amazing. <laughs> so I would like to comment on uh, the management update. Just noting on um, page 59 of the report, I'm really happy to see that you're flushing get the lines getting ready for uh, the water transfers. It says it's just in service area one. My understanding is that your district is expanding the water transfer pilot project this year to service area two. So I'm wondering why service area two is not also being flushed. I have a question for uh, the conservation um, district, the conservation department, um, also on page 59, it talks about the water demand offset bank status as of uh, this month. And from 105.8 acre feet, um, it's now down to 55.5 acre feet. My question is, does it stay at that or will, um, will it sort of roll over in another, at the beginning of the year or the water year? Um, and will that number be increased? Um, I also want to comment a bit on Mr. DeFore's uh, oral report. Um, I have written your board about what I find very um, objectionable structuring around the new Granite Way well. It isn't at all what I was told would be there when um, I took some action in the Aptos Village project uh, in 2016. It is very uh, unsightly. <laughs> and um, I feel like I really, I, I've written the board, I've gotten no response. I'm not the only one that feels this way. And I would like your board to somehow uh, address this issue because it is not at all in keeping with the character, the visual character of the area, and not at all what um, people were told a couple of years ago would most likely go in there. I also note that um, although Mr. Dufour has promised the results of the Twin Lakes uh, pilot recharge injection well, a critical part of Pure Water SoCal project, it's still not here. And it was promised to your board by the summer, and I haven't heard him present it yet. So I would like something about that, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? On only on the management update. Not, no, when were public you, that was over when you got here. No, it wasn't. Yes, it, it was. was. That's not true. I mean, that's not true at excuse all. me, do you want to be removed? I, there was no public comment. There, there was, was public, public comment. You were late. No one was here. So if you have something to say about the management update, that is all that you can talk about right now. Well, yes, I do as well. Uh, that's I asked the only for inclusion thing. into your records the comments regarding the management update, and I'm providing a public requ uh, information request to Mr. Basso uh, as well, so that nobody can say it wasn't delivered to you because no one would sign for it. On the management update, what she's responding to, uh, frankly, includes Becky's comments regarding your whether did you comply with the California Environmental Quality Act. No, where's and that? You haven't that? done that. Where's that in the management update? It's part of your obligations. No, not no, the management Well, update. I would ask for an opportunity to make my public comments. You missed that. you evaded it. As usual, you're trying to keep the truth from the public. Excuse me, sir. But we opened public hearing. We opened it and we closed it after people were allowed to speak and that was, you were not here. I was told it didn't occur. No, it, it did occur. You didn't, you jumped. No, we did no, not. we didn't. We called for people. We went straight through our agenda, sir. You were just not here. I'm sorry you were late. Go look at the video. I'm sorry you were late, but you were. So we'll, we're moving on now. Thank you. I'm gonna answer a question um, about the water demand offset bank. Um, the offset balance doesn't change, you know, that is what the balance is. As it is used, it goes down, period. And um, when it gets to a certain point, we're gonna reevaluate. So that's all. It doesn't change other than that. Okay, so um, next item is um,
district council. The only thing I wanted to report was there was a decision of the California Supreme Court in the spring, late spring, called Ramona Woods, partly or somebody like that versus Ramona Woods, which was a case involving a water, a municipal water and sewer district. And the sewer, in their sewer analysis, they changed the way they evaluated different entities in terms of how they would charge them based on square footage instead of what they'd used before. And then they went ahead and had a rate hearing under 218. And the restaurant involved did not protest at the 218 hearing. They then filed a lawsuit challenging this analysis. And the trial court said because they hadn't protested at the 218 hearing, they had not exhausted their administrative remedies. The District Court of Appeal disagreed and the Supreme Court also disagreed, saying that the analysis of the sewer requirement was not the rates and therefore it would have been futile for them to even appear because they weren't challenging the rates, they were challenging this early analysis. The reason I bring it up is that a number of agencies now in Northern California have received a letter all from the same law firm uh, challenging their rates based on that case. There's been like, I think from what I can gather from the Legal Affairs Committee, something like 15 letters that have gone out to different entities. We have not received one. I don't know of anybody else in this county, but somebody is going to be arguing that that case stands for the basis you don't even have to protest at a 218 hearing. I don't think that's what it says, but that's obviously where it's going, so we'll keep an eye on it. Okay, anything else? That's it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next, we'll move on to administrative business, um, item 6.2. Um, this is to do with ground, a discussion on getting board input on, um, there's nothing like no decision to be made, it's just getting input yeah, on, on available groundwater-based triggers. Really very preliminary and kind of a follow-up to um, uh, past board discussions about curtailment declarations and trigger conditions that uh, we, we use for um, uh, making those declarations. So I've, I want to start by giving a little bit of background on our water shortage contingency plan and how it fits into the state's regulatory requirements and its purpose. Um, due to our size, we're considered an urban water supplier, and as such, every five years, we're required by the state to submit an updated urban water management plan. Those plans require an assessment of our water supplies and how we'll best meet water demand over a 20-year planning horizon under both best cases, meaning we have plenty of water to meet demand, and worst cases, meaning we're facing some sort of supply shortage. Um, we currently operate under our 2015 Urban Water Management Plan, which was submitted in 2016, and we'll fully begin working on our 2020 um, update in the spring of 2020, with that plan being due in July 2021, so that's kind of the timeline. Um, so the next plan will be from 2020 to 2025, which will overlap with some different supply situations at the district with Pure Water SoCal coming online in 2022. So um, that's one thing to think about too as we move ahead and update this plan. Um, we're seeking to get a jump start on a big component of the plan, which is the water shortage contingency plan. Um, and we wanna get input based on um, past discussions with the board indicating changes might be desired, particularly related to the trigger conditions. Um, we also wanna get ahead of this because as time goes on, the state comes up with additional requirements and that increases the complexity of completing the plan. And again, um, with our change in supplemental water supplies that we're expecting um, in a few years. So the purpose of the water shortage contingency plan is to conserve and protect the available water supply for domestic use, sanitation, and fire protection, and to protect and preserve public health, welfare, and safety. And it defines specifically how we respond to supply shortages due to longer term conditions, and in our district that means groundwater overdraft and seawater intrusion. 
and also reduce groundwater recharge due to drought. And then there's also more short-term or catastrophic conditions due to loss of power, fires, earthquakes, and that sort of thing, um, which impact our production uh, capacity and require us to take immediate actions to keep water flowing for important um, domestic purposes. So our discussion tonight really focuses on the shortages due to the long-term conditions, namely overdraft and seawater intrusion. So in general, um, the severity of a water supply shortage determines the declaration of a corresponding shortage stage that calls for a desired level of, of curtailment um, for customers and the actions or requirements needed by um, customers, but also um, by the district to meet those curtailment targets. And so our current water shortage contingency plan here is shown as attachment one. Um, this is the, the basic um, guts of the plan, and um, it identifies as stage zero, meaning we always need customers to use water efficiently, um, as well as stages one through five with cur uh, curtailment targets ranging from five in uh, stage one up to 50% and a stage five. And those curtailment targets are compared to a 2013 pumping baseline, which was kind of our pre-drought um, peak in consumption. Currently, those trigger conditions are basis for declaring, for the board to declare a shortage stage due to long-term conditions are rainfall totals over a five-year, the past five-year period as correlated to estimated recharge amounts. And then the second condition is the presence of a groundwater emergency, and that was what we um, went through in 2014 with um, hydrometrics and then the peer review of that report um, showing that uh, we did indeed um, have severe overdraft in a groundwater emergency. Historically, we've presented to the board this um, er information every year after the end of a water year, which ends on March 30th, so generally in the April-May timeframe, we bring that to the board and ask you to declare a shortage stage needed to address the long-term conditions affecting our supply. And over the past couple of years, when we've evaluated this information, um, you've asked some really um, important good questions about whether there may be more specific measurable conditions that might provide a better indication of basin conditions than our current rainfall and recharge trigger condition. So um, in our preparation for our next urban plan revision, we thought we would, um, our idea was to basically get your input and come up with um, some potential new groundwater based conditions or set of conditions that could be used as a, a supplementary piece of information when you go through this exercise in the spring and then be further refined um, after that and rolled into our next urban water management plan. So in essence, we're really asking to pilot some new conditions and see um, how they work out compared to our current, current ones. We've uh, been working with our hydrologist, Cameron Tana, of Montgomery and Associates and have come up with a couple potential options for those groundwater based trigger conditions for your um, discussion and input and those are briefly defined in the memo. Cameron will be elaborating in a lot more detail um, tonight about how they would work and the pros and cons um, to facilitate that discussion. Um, when we went through this process it became clear to us that there were some bigger picture questions that it would be really important to get your um, feedback and clarity on before we launch into really specific things um, and because those will help inform which direction the board wants to go. And so those questions are, are really related to um, curtailment and what you view as being the goal or purpose of curtailment, um, both now and as well as looking into the future with supplemental water supply. Um, in you know past historical time, 
uh, conservation and curtailment has been seen as a insurance policy toward um, preventing worsening of seawater intrusion conditions and overdraft um, and so we want to I guess just make sure that that's still how you're looking at it as we move forward it it the level of curtailment that we would need to do more than that to say restore the basin we know that we can't do that with conservation curtailment alone and hence we need desperately need su supplemental water supply so that was one of the big questions um, the second one was just the using of the groundwater conditions um, with the board uh, typically uh, we've looked at uh, data over periods of time recognizing that things don't necessarily change that fast in our groundwater conditions and um, so we've we've looked at say the five-year rainfall and recharge totals um, so we're assuming that you would probably want to continue with that as opposed to looking at things over like a one-year period or a two-year period and then just get your feedback on what measures of groundwater condition do you think might be most useful in informing water shortage stages Declarations including chloride concentrations, percentage of wells at protective elevations, uh, percentage change in well levels from previous years, and I'm sure there's, there's probably more options to that as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cameron, and he can give, um, I think, kind of an overview of the first the two options that we've come up with there could be others or variations on these and then possibly circle back and talk about those goals and then jump back into the options and see where we land with that so this is more of like a workshop and open discussion item um, on trigger conditions thank you Shelley and thank you uh, board um, so I will go over the, the two options that are listed in, in the board memo. Basically with uh, illustrative examples, these are not specific proposals for you to consider as uh, Shelley alluded to, but just kind of ideas for you to, to consider in your discussion and hopefully build upon and, and give us feedback on whether either of these options are in the right direction and fit what you would want to accomplish with, with these uh, with these additional triggers in, in the water shortage contingency plan. Um, so option number one focuses uh, only on observed groundwater levels in general and uh, what is suggested is to evaluate the observed groundwater levels relative to the predictive elevations which we in the past have estimated as are necessary to, to prevent seawater intrusion over the long term. The figure that you see on this slide, I will be returning to uh, throughout uh, discussion of these options because they, this figure represents uh, what groundwater levels say about the risk of seawater intrusion when compared to those protective elevations. Quick question, is just yes. this is still gonna be like the 70% of the runs? Yeah, so the protective elevations and then the minimum thresholds in the, in the GSP um, that is uh, up for approval this week uh, are based off of 70% of the cross-sectional runs uh, for preventing seawater intrusion. Uh, we, and, and because um, and at some wells in the basin, coastal monitoring wells, they are still below that minimum threshold. And because of that, the overtraft conditions uh, that were the technical basis for the groundwater emergency declaration in 2014 are still in place. Uh, what we have expanded upon in evaluating the groundwater elevations is not just to evaluate whether it's below or above 70 percent, but show the, the, the relative percentage risk for what the elevation is and how many runs, percentage of runs, are protective. So. Uh, in these, in these figures that are repeated here, larger dots means there's a higher risk of seawater intrusion because of lower groundwater levels. So the biggest dots mean there's uh, greater than 50% of long-term seawater intrusion based off of, of the groundwater levels, and then the smaller dots are less percentage risk of seawater intrusion. And what the suggestion of this option is, is basically to 
compare the groundwater levels at the coastal monitoring wells in the district to with those percentages and try to come up with an average amount of, of seawater intrusion risk and set the curtailment stage based off of that average uh, seawater intrusion risk. So do, do I understand this correctly that a, a circle with the size of 30 percent is essentially equivalent to our 70 percent protective level? Right. Yeah. So this is the inverse, you could say, of, of okay. the, uh, the protective level. So the 30 percent is the it's medium medium sized circle 20 right. 30 percent so yep. anything that's above that medium sized circle wouldn't be protective at the 70 percent correct yes okay yeah and so there are a few at you know a few wells that are uh, below 70 percent and even below 50 percent in this figure this is using 2017 data in any evaluation we would use updated data we would use we would likely use the five-year average as stated in the GSP for evaluating these groundwater levels but uh, using this as a illustration of, of this these options so if we have these number oh, oh, oh go ahead we what can I was go gonna ahead. ask about is given all these numbers how would we yeah through? I mean uh, there are diff I think there are definitely different ways to do it and this is again just an illustration of possible way to do it to assign different curtailment levels and stages to the different risk levels that we observe in, in the groundwater levels. Um, I think there are, notice there are some curtailment level assigned to risk levels that we consider protective, that there's you know, it's more than 70 percent out. So that could be, this all could be changed, this ranking can be changed, but I just wanted to illustrate how the idea of how it would work. So basically, the lower the groundwater level relative to the protective elevation, I mean, a higher risk of seawater intrusion at that location, assign a curtailment level, and then look at all of it together and see kind of what the average curtailment would be based off of those assignments. So here we basically assign lower curtailment level to higher groundwater levels, and when groundwater levels are well below the protective elevation that there's more than a 50% chance that there would be seawater intrusion over the long term, we high assign the highest stage, highest curtailment level. So I'm still not clear. So this is going to be different for each monitoring well. So how are those, so say for one particular monitoring well, nine, you know, are you talking about the number of runs that are protective out of all the monitoring wells? Uh, so we'll look at each specific monitoring well and the groundwater level at that monitoring well yeah. and how protective is that groundwater level at that monitoring well. And we would assign, we would assign some curtailment level to that to monitoring that well. Okay. And then we would look at all the monitoring wells and kind of average the, that curtailment level. And, okay. I mean, you could argue that if one monitoring wells below you know 70 percent then you have to cur have curtailment period right right yes yeah, yes yeah, so that those are the conditions <laughs> of the groundwater emergency that lead okay. you to curtailment i think what we're trying to get at in this option is to provide a a mechanism where you determine the the level of curtailment and so the idea is to give get an idea of the relative situation with respect to the seawater intrusion risk and use that to set your your stage of of uh certain stage of curtailment so for example if you have one well that is below uh but everywhere else is above and you're in the condition of overdraft you know the, the conditions for your ground the groundwater emergency are still in place so that the curtailment there should you know there, there is a basis for the curtailment but how much curtailment? So maybe in that case there would be less curtailment, while if more wells were underneath, you would have more curtailment. So that's this is just okay. the concept behind that. Um, and I, I think these questions are basically the questions we want to hear you ask and okay. kind of expand upon and see does this make sense? Is that really getting at what you want to get at with with curtailment? And and so how it would be applied is 
for each of these wells, you would apply that curtailment level based off of the risk level. So you can see the bigger circles with the bigger risk, the lower groundwater levels have a higher curtailment level. While the, some of the wells are uh, protective even at um, over 99% of the runs, and then we would say that those should be assigned 0%, we would take the nine results in the district and uh, assign them to all the wells uh, the, all those coastal wells in the district and then average this percentage. So in this case, based off of these data, just for illustrative purposes, it all averages the 12%, which is in the range of the 15% stage two curtailment. Um, so I see some spe skeptical looks, but that this is just the idea is <laughs> if you had more, if you had more wells that were in worse, it would have a higher percentage and you would lead yourself to a, a, a greater, greater stage. And this just, this is just uh, kind of get the relative situation of what the groundwater conditions are, recognizing that it's still an overdraft either way. And to me the pros of it, um, the pros of it is that it's relatively simple. I th we, we can just take the groundwater levels. We have the information from the cross-sectional models. We can make, the staff can make this calculation, I think, pretty easily. Um, the, the cons of it uh, is that it's not really targeted to achieving some specific condition. It's just, uh, it's just said the relative conditions. It's getting better, so we will reduce curtailment. It's getting worse, so we'll, we'll increase curtailment. So it's I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So the disconnect that I'm seeing here is just because we have a curtailment stage. Mm -hmm. First of all, it doesn't mean that we're going to get that curtailment unless we're not. You know, we're not enforcing it. We're. We, but the main major, major disconnect is that unless we can manage the basin based on a lower demand that could result from the curtailment to effectively um, improve conditions at the coastal wells that are um, that have the the higher risk of seawater intrusion then really the the average number doesn't doesn't mean anything I mean same can, here can, <laughs> If you've got one well that's at 50%, then you're in a groundwater emergency and you're, you need to be at a reasonably high level of curtailment to try and protect that. Yeah, and these are, you know, just <laughs> to be fair, I mean, th this is an illustrative purpose example, I know. conceptual. I yeah. Uh, yeah. We're not recommending yeah. it. We're just, we, I know we right. you're, you're getting. I'm just saying averages work in some one places, yeah. but yeah, not I everywhere. Agree. We just had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I think, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with an average, uh, you could also say the worst one. You could sure. set that. Um, it doesn't have to be an average. The idea here is that it's all just based off of groundwater levels by itself. Uh, and you know, I would recommend relating it to the protective elevations and the seawater intrusion risk level because that is, that is the major, that's the reason why this basin is in overdraft. But, um, and the, su the, the suggestion here is use an average, but if uh, um, a minimum makes more sense, that, that's what we want, want here. But we also have another option that, that we can uh, share with you as well. Bruce. Uh, one concern I have, which maybe you can resolve for me, is uh, it's important to have immediacy. And by that I mean, um, you know, if this is a dry year, then you expect to have a fairly high level of cutback. And if it's a wet year, you don't. And with this, you could have a year when, you know, pe th so much rain coming down, people are starting to take animals two by two into the ark, and, and yet you could still have a groundwater emergency. At, stage three, stage four, mm -hmm. and that would be very discouraging. People would just basically stop ig ignoring all that because mm -hmm. you know, you're not saying anything about what the year is like and what people need to do. And so I was wondering how could you, I mean, that's one of the nice things about what we do now is yeah. that every rain year says what the stage is for that year. So there's this connection, there's this immediacy between the conditions and the, and the level. Right. And with this, that, that pretty much disconnects it. And uh, because these, change very slowly so you could have a 
you know, stage four going on year after year after year after year after year, even though the rain's going up and down and up and down and up. And mm -hmm. and or, the, or the opposite being you have a couple of really bad years with very little rain, but it hasn't, since, it, since there's here. a delay, it hasn't yes. shown up right. yet. Well, there was, I mean, the <laughs> rain, and I was one of the people that was skeptical about the rainfall as a criterion for setting stages, but it does have a relationship, you know, in evapotranspiration that, you know, more rain means less drawing from the aquifer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier for customers to not use as much water, mm -hmm. and so they or they don't have the same demand as during a drought year. The droughts are emergencies because there's so little rainfall that it's causing increased demand at the same time that we need to really curtail that because um, we're in overdraft. Yeah. So uh, there's some some relationship between the two would probably be. There may be some combination. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I also want to know whether you could separate like the acute emergencies. Like for example, we what were we declaring for these planned shutdowns? Mm -hmm. Go back to the fire thing. It's just the most immediate thing. It, but that's an ex that's another extreme. It's a separate case altogether from that's our right. general water emergency. I was just wondering if we, at the same time we're working on this, we could work on a short-term emergency situation. This is the long-term one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost exactly. think when we um, update our urban plan, this, this component of it, that we should almost kind of have two plans, one for the long-term supply shortages and one for those kind of more catastrophic things. Because the condition or the requirements that we're asking of people to do and the programs that we're implementing to help people achieve those curtailments are completely different. And so you're not, you're, it would be better if they're really two separate kind of elements of the plan, if you ask me. We should probably let, let him finish oh his no, other so ideas. Yeah, that's, I just was throwing that out while I had the a chance. The next slide's mm. gonna be the answer. <laughs> The next yeah. slide will be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, yeah, I've, the next slide is an answer. I don't know if it's <laughs> the answer. Um, I mean, to, to answer, to try to address the question about using rainfall, I and mean, that is part of the current water shortage contingency plan. We did tr you know, try to design that as rainfall, recognizing the uh, groundwater system, especially towards the coast in a, in a confined aquifer, uh, reacts relatively slowly to uh, short-term changes in rainfall. So that evaluation was kind of looking at kind of a more longer term uh, rainfall uh, tr trend with the idea that, that if you had multiple years of low rainfall that indicates that the long-term recharge would, might be decreasing, um, which wouldn't really be indicated by any one dry year or, or uh, not indicated by any wet year. So that, that was the idea behind what is in, in place now. Um, the, the, what we were trying to address is that there is the option of declaring curtailment based off of, of the groundwater emergency which is based off of groundwater levels. And so uh, the first option was say, let's just look at the groundwater levels relative to what is, what is the basis for the groundwater emergency and try to give the district an idea of what level of curtailment to set. And so um, it, is, it, is, it is based off of, of that relative, but uh, you know, it's good to hear your questions about it because I think they're all very reasonable questions. Um, the, sec the second option, um, going on to the next slide, I is to be more intentional about what kind of groundwater level improvement the district uh, wants to, or groundwater, I shouldn't even say improvement, just about what kind of groundwater levels the district would like to achieve with curtailment in advance of having a supplemental supply that could achieve a full recovery. So is there an interim goal until that supplemental supply comes online that the district would want to achieve and then based groundwater levels and then try to assess what kind of groundwater pumping could achieve that interim goal. Um, so is a, a measurable goal for 
groundwater levels and also a measurable goal for, for pumping. Um, so, you know, this could be many different things. It could be whatever you would like to achieve in, in preventing seawater intrusion. I think it would be, it makes sense to, to focus on the coastal groundwater levels. Um, but, you know, it could be something simple, the follows simple concept is to raise the groundwater levels where the risk is highest. You have groundwater levels which are, show, uh, that are less than 50% protective. And so, you know, what kind of, maybe the goal is to raise those higher to a certain level, um, unlikely to be able to achieve a full recovery just with curtailment, but what, is there a level that is an interim goal to, to achieve um, at, at the coast with the groundwater levels? And then having said that, um, and this is where it takes a little bit more work, uh, probably more input from, from us as your groundwater hydrologist, what level of pumping curtailment could achieve that groundwater level goal? And then set your curtailment, which right now is based off of reduction from 2013 levels, and you know, what kind of pumping levels would achieve what, what you want to achieve uh, in, in the few years before a supplemental supply comes online. So that, that's the basis of, of the second option uh, that we suggest for consideration, but there's, there's certainly other options that we would, we would uh, be glad to consider more and, and come up with more detail as well. Cameron, do you want to talk about the kind of the pros and cons of that option? Right, yeah, so um, thank you for the reminder. So I, I think the pro is that it does, it is measurable, it kind of sets a measurable goal. Um, it, it really, it, it's more intentional about what you're trying to achieve with the curtailment. Uh, the con is that it, it will take more upfront effort, potentially more, and I think more effort from year to year and if in assessing, um, in kind of estimating what kind of pumping would achieve that goal, uh, which could involve some, some groundwater modeling to, to evaluate that. And then from year to year, assessing whether that, that goal was getting, was, is getting you to, the, to that goal. Um, so, so I think that the con is more, more on the, the effort side uh, of, of things. And the cost side. Right, because and that effort would equals cost, right. Something we would need to rely on I think you could get a mixed strategy by using option one, but instead of just using a regular old vanilla average, you could use a weighted average. And that's kind of what this is doing, where the weight is, you know, for the two circled ones there, is 100% and everything else is 0%. But you could have a mixed strategy where, you know, the, the distance away from uh, protective levels mm -hmm. it indicates the weight that that gets applied to that. And that would be th basically the same effort it would do to St for strategy one. Right, um, and, and so, so I, I think that we were getting at that where you know, your percent risk or percent protective could lead you to, um, to that weighting, mm -hmm. but uh, the question was what, what curtailment stage do you assign to you know, what, what level you end up with there? And so that, that, that is, I mean, that's something that the board would need to, to weigh, on, weigh, in, weigh in on, but that's, that's, where, that's where we kind of came up with assigning specific curtailment levels to specific levels of risk and averaging based off of that was, was the genesis of that. I also had some concerns when you're mentioning uh, using the pumping, um, and that isn't a fixed thing because, you know, Taj every year decides, are you gonna pump more here and less here? And so that can change act even from month to month. And so um, if you were to try and incorporate that in, that would get complicated because, you know, you pump from this well, and well, it affects this uh, monitoring well and that monitoring well, but half of this one and two thirds of that one. And so uh, I think trying to use pumping would be very complicated. Um, yeah, so I mean, it would become, uh, I mean, it, it, because you then have a goal to reach, it would become become more of a management challenge to try to reach that goal. Um, the, the idea is to set the overall pumping goal that puts into place the possibility with some kind of pumping distribution that you could achieve the groundwater level goal, mm -hmm. um, which is what you are going to need to do with Pure Water Soquel. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is part of Pure Water Soquel is a pumping distribution right. to raise groundwater levels throughout throughout the district. So 
it is it is going to be a management challenge that um, the, the district will need to implement at, at some point. That's a good point. Uh, Michelle? Okay. Um, I'm like a believer in keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I'm wondering if we could do a hybrid where drought conditions will still trigger what they trigger now, but when you get to the borderline, that's when you start to delve closer in to see if you need to go one way or the other, because that's where I was kind of concerned mm -hmm. before, is when we were borderline, you know, we had almost enough rain and we were kind of going back and forth what um, level of severity we wanted to um, use. So could we do something like that? It d why does it have to be all one method? It, it does not. I, I actually think the district staff was was thinking that the rainfall criteria that we that are in there now, um, I mean, they could be modified, but that would not be necessarily replaced by looking at the the groundwater level conditions. Um, there was just there was. Mm -hmm. thinking that we should also look at groundwater level conditions, especially in years when you're, when the curtailment is based off of the groundwater emergency and not on the rain. So yeah. um, it w was to put that in, in, to have that in there as, as well. Um, but it, you know, it is, I think all options are on the table to, to replace the rainfall um, would be an option, but it's not, it's not something that we're suggesting. Okay, then I just misunderstood. Yes. So, uh, since um, since the Pure Water Soquel is designed for to combat uh, or prevent seawater intrusion, then how, I mean, what about how workable would that be to use that as a criterion if that's the, you know, we'd have a state of a state of the the well the recharge if effort as part of our criterion too or what would, how would that fit in and we um, right we yeah put this five-year plan in place and assuming right in the middle of it perhaps that we may even have a project mm -hmm. that's about to come online yeah I, I think most of these curtailment um items especially related to groundwater emergency but even related to the rainfall i i, I don't think i, I don't think you would apply with the project line line meant to achieve basin recovery and and a sustainable basin and and that will take a couple of, you know a couple of years um <coughs> uh, according to the to the modeling it will take a little bit of time and and to with your new project to ha also have curtailment when it's making progress i don't think that would nece that would be necessary but that is that's an option for uh for the district if if they wanted to make sure that they're having progress even on top of the progress from from the project so um i think you would want to let the project work and and solve the issue without this additional curtailment at that time i, I really view these questions as what do you want to do until that project comes online so that you you you, you protect the basin as much as you can, how much is reasonable, um, and given that the conditions are in place for the groundwater emergency you've declared. I have a scheme I came up with that I'd like to throw out, and, and you can might mold it over if you want. Um, I think it's important to have this based initially on the rainfall data, because we get that every year, and that would give us the immediacy that I think is really important, so that you know, in a wet year, it would be better and in real dry year it would be real worse and that's kind of a thing but you're you're quite correct all of you that that the important thing is uh, recharge and then even more important than that is the protective levels mm -hmm. and what's the best tool we have to con connect rainfall data to those things it's our groundwater model so we basically we we take our model which we have all the data for up until this year and then we pump, we put in this year's data and and try it. And in fact, we want to then run that data out for several years because it might take several years for that change to make it down into the recharge and then into the protective levels. And we could then 
try and see how long that goes. But basically, we were we saying, okay, if the rainfall this year was 28 inches, which is a little below average, and we kept doing that for the next five years, 10 years, whatever, what would happen to a protective levels? Would they get better? Would they get worse? If they're getting better, then I'd say we wouldn't do much in terms of these emergency rates because we're actually improving things, and that's good. And if it's getting worse, then, then we'd really want to crank up those levels. And so mm -hmm. that's what we use. We, it would be both the immediacy and the connection to the, those levels that I think are fundamentally important to us. I just want to make one other point as I think about it is that um, I agree that some kind of hybrid would be a good idea, but to me, as long as you have any of the monitoring wells that are below protective levels, we have to have some level of curtailment because um, that's what we're doing now. I mean, so when are we going to lift a groundwater emergency? When we've reached protective levels at all our wells. So this kind of needs to be, to me, that fallback position where you know you're, you, you can't, I don't think you can let up until you feel like, because if you have one well that's below protective levels, seawater intrusion can happen while we're waiting around. So I don't know, that's just my thought on that. But th that issue, you might be able to solve that without doing any cutback at all just by changing your pumping around. Right, right, pumping. right. No, I, I so think, I agree. Mm -hmm. that, and I think you're right. I think, Cameron, you make a good point. We, we need to get used to this new new adaptation of, of using the modeling to, to maybe change our pumping so that, because we're going to need to do that anyway. <laughs> any other comments, questions? And then I'll have that open it to the public yeah. after that. So I do like rainfall as mm -hmm. one of the criteria. I love rainfall. I do yeah. too. <laughs> and and I miss yeah, we get it. But they, but they, and I like that we have it multi-year, not just single year, because mm -hmm. that's how the system responds. Um, and as a pragmatic matter, we are in a groundwater emergency, so all these stages can be declared. So what I see is what I would like to see is some evaluation of whether our rainfall um, criteria is um, correct mm -hmm. okay. and and perhaps modify it and the model could could be useful in that I like uh, director Daniel's idea of, of also using the model in a kind of a forecast mode to kind of let us know what's happening which we don't have and when we're looking at his historical so that would help me with with determining the stage um, and I agree with with uh, director LeHue as, as well that the you know when you have one well that's you know below that, those levels if, if seawater intrusion is happening you're losing uh, storage space in the aquifer and potentially endangering uh, production wells, which are not cheap to move, so. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and then, well, uh, There's another strategy, which is, as you point out, you know, when we have a supplemental supply and it's up and working, mm -hmm. um, we don't need this at all. And so that may be just, I don't know, a few years down the road after we get this thing built, and when, which is a few years down the road. So why even spend time doing this? Just our th current scheme works okay, and it's pretty decent because it does try and connect to, you know, recharge and so forth. And just continue to use it what we got, rather than spend a lot of time and effort doing something that may or may not help us really. Okay. Um, thanks, Cameron. I think I'll open it up to see if there's any public comment, and then we'll come back to the board. Remember, no decisions are being made. We're just giving feedback. Yep. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Um, thank you, Mr. Tana, for that great presentation. I wonder if it will be part of the minutes. Um, I know you've rearranged your website, so you have presentations separate from um, other okay. things, but I really think the public needs to see this information. I will um, note that um, Mr. Tana said that the pumping rates w in the model would be based on, and correct me if I'm wrong here, 
uh, would be based on your 2013 pumping levels. That is much higher than what you actually are seeing now, thanks to your good customer conservation and your very high rates. <laughs> so actually, you know, I think it's interesting to look at the map there that shows um, there are basically two out of 13 monitoring wells that are uh, look like they're below protective levels, SC5A and SC8. I will point out that SCA4 is not in the Parisma um, in the Mid County Basin, and the uh, Mr. Tana's report of the uh, Mid count Mid Year Water Report uh, actually stated that, and also that the uh, SoCal Point, which is the other big circle up there, is not in your service district. What I note is absent here is discussion about cooperative efforts with Santa Cruz City. And they are also aggressively uh, looking to raise groundwater levels and are doing a lot of um, aquifer storage recovery projects in the Belts Well field. Uh, and they're planning to expand those this year. So I really would love to hear more discussion about the cooperative efforts. And um, also note that Again, things don't look all that bad. Two out of 13 wells um, showing some problem. And in this report, again, um, the mid-year water report, most of the wells state, uh, results state, there's no indication of seawater intrusion. I will also say that your rainfall um, model is, I think, is a good way to go, but um, on page 62 of your packet, you, you have never left stage three. Even in 2016, 17, when water rain levels were very high, and even though groundwater levels have risen since then, your production levels have decreased, your service connections have increased, but people are staying with their low levels of conservation. So this is all very interesting to me that you stay at stage three which is, I think, a way to bring in extra Thank you. money. Thank you. Any other comment on this item? Okay, any other board comments? All right, I hope we've given you some input and not, all, not that we all agree, but... Um, Too much input. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did, I yes, have Michelle? I did an idea that I forgot to state, but Becky reminded me, is um, when we set, like, what levels we're at, um, even when we're groundwater, maybe we do have higher, but we're also prepared to help the city if they need water. Yeah, the, the groundwater sustainability plan clearly shows that in the modeling that their efforts are greatly enhanced by like this Pure Water SoCal project because they want to put water in, but then also pull back out. By, so by having a steady source of recharge, it reduces their impact. Right. That's not exactly what I was saying. But oh, okay. okay. What, what I was saying is that when we decide if it's a water emergency or not, um, it may be that we have pretty good groundwater levels, but it's not raining. Right. And right. we right. need to right. recognize that some of that water we may be wanting to share with the city rather than um, saying, well, it's, it's, you know, it's not raining, but we have plenty of water, so we're not in an emergency. Right, and th yeah, that's a good point. And the other thing I think that is uh, that I've kind of rediscovered, I think, and especially listening to the state board and the bigger picture things, uh, to get focused on two years, things are, you know, okay at this moment. It's the long term <laughs> that they're concerned about, really. It's yes. not the short term. That's what term. we should do, yeah. too. Yeah. Right, and I, you know, I just, I guess I've made it clear that it, to me, if there's any, any, if there's one well that's not protected, we're at risk. So until those are all protective levels, I'm not going to relax. Um, Same. All right, um, so let's move on to item 6.3, um, approval agreement for Best Western Creeker. Right. Um, this is about the uh, uh, approval, board request for approval of the agreement with BBK, Best Western Creeker, for general legal counsel. Uh, as we know, our current council, 1969, landing on the moon maybe, Bob Basso, 50 <laughs> years uh, strong. Um, 
but everybody has to uh, retire sometime. And so we've been preparing for that. And we went out uh, a couple months ago, solicited RFQs. We had 11 responses to that. Uh, that RFQs are requests uh, for yes, comments. Yes, thank you. Your request for, for uh, qualifications. qualifications. So qualifications. ask firms to put forth their best foot, how well qualified they are to, to suit our needs. And uh, 11 really good proposals. There's a lot of good uh, legal firms out there. So that was exciting. We culled that down to six, uh, interviewed those to, to some extent, and there was a there was a board and staff input on this, several committees, and then down to three, and then there was uh, also interviews in a, a closed session reported out the um, outcome of that, and that was selection unanimously by the, uh, I think unanimously, by the uh, board to select BBK. And with that, I'll, I'll just add right now, we have the general counsel, uh, Josh Nelson, is right here, if you would stand up, and Samantha Chen, assistant, uh, our deputy uh, general counsel. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and, and going through the process. Um, so there's a couple things in the agenda you can, or in the packet that I'm sure you read. Uh, I won't go into that. It's a uh, waiver from BBK to the city because they do represent the city on some issues uh, not related to, to water. And then um, the draft agreement for BBK, General Legal Counsel, uh, for General to be our GC. So staff recommends the district board enter into a new agreement, which is attachment three with BBK and continue uh, in full uh, force and effect until terminated. Uh, the agreement will be reviewed at least annually for performance and, and compensation. And a couple of things I'll add on just logistically, I think that are important, there may be questions. Um, the idea is to keep uh, Mr. Basso on, and he, uh, he's agreed to stay on until January 1st and potentially uh, uh, if we need his services later, we can contract back out with him at periodically if they this team think that's a, a benefit and we do. And then the other thing is at, at the start, the contract, as you can see, is envisioned to be uh, hourly, by uh, paid by the hour. You can see the hourly rate. And then if we go down, as we go down the road, potentially move into more of a uh, retainer um, situation. So trying to work what's best for uh, our customers, us, and the, and the firm, because it's a partnership. Uh, questions from the board or anything? Okay, I, I just gonna make a quick comment just that um, I appreciate Bob being willing to kind of overlap a little bit because there's a wealth of knowledge there and I think, you know, anybody coming in could benefit from the wealth of knowledge that you have and so if, as we as needed in, in the coming year or so, you know, it'd be nice to be able to contract out for, for help you know, and give advice. So that would be appreciated. Happy to do it. Um, all right, so um, any public comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I've been curious to see who you would select. And um, I think you've made a good choice with Best Best and Krieger. I think it will save your customers a lot of money not to have to, uh, because of their their company's excellent environmental law expertise. Um, so you won't have to contract out with their firm whenever you are legally challenged in that arena. I have a question. Um, so it'll be. $270 an hour for attorneys and $170 for paralegals. What, um, what is the hour, hourly, uh, how many hours a month do you think that they will be signing on to, to help you? What can customers expect to see in terms of the legal bill? You've been paying Mr. Basso $8,000 a month plus medical benefits. What change will you see, your customers see in this legal change? And I note that um, in certain instances, there would be specialized legal counsel, such as Ms. Ulat, who has been leading your challenge against the uh, Pure Water SoCal. She charges 325 an hour. 
So w what would be the trigger that would bring someone of her higher uh, fees into the picture and what can your rate uh, payers expect? Best Best and Krieger is in, um, well, I see they have several offices, but the closest being Walnut Creek. Is that where these people would be coming from? Would they travel as Miss Ouellette has done every time from Riverside? Uh, or would they be able to somehow do a teleconference and thereby save your customers some, some money? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Colonel Terry Maxwell, a rate payer and customer, and a concerned one. Uh, first of all, you've been paying Mr. Basso $8,000 a month. You're a water district. You're not a multinational corporation. You're not a university campus with 100,000 students. You could have had a competent attorney who taken a few environmental law courses represent you perfectly adequately. There was no reason for Mr. Basso to intrigue or invite or solicit Best Best and Krieger to come in here and for you to budget several hundred thousand dollars of your ratepayers' customers' money needlessly to defend a lawsuit against a little old lady who's amply a nice little old lady, but Miss a gray-haired lady without a law degree. And you have had spent Hundreds of thousands of dollars. What were you paying Mr. Basso for for all these years? Wasn't his retain? Why did you fail to stick up for your ratepayers and customers and hold Mr. Basso responsible for performing that which you were paying him for? What negligence on your part? Profligate negligence. If you were in a corporation, why did we pay Mr. Basso? Well, he's supposed to provide the legal services. Frankly, a first-year law graduate could have represented you and would have told you if he was and, and with integrity and ethically, you should settle with Ms. Steinbrenner and comply with the California Environmental Quality Act and look at all the alternatives and not have to spend $130 million. You could have jumped to the $23 million locker for alternative. Another reason why there's no need for you. The state of California can't come in here fast enough and take over this water district and consolidate the rest of the region. Speaking of, and we wouldn't need Best Best and Krieger to pay them half a million dollars next year or a half a million for prior work that Mr. Basso was incompetent to perform, unable to perform. What is going on here? Have you no pride? Did any of you ever say to Mr. Basso in one of your meetings, Mr. Basso, why are we paying you if you can't defend us against Mrs. Ms. Steinbrenner in her pro se college graduate efforts to have us comply with the California Environmental Quality Act? Apparently he wasn't up to it. He should refund that money. In fact, speaking of it, you should all be held accountable for the money you have wasted in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you should all be removed by the customers and ratepayers here in a recall effort. And thirdly, you should probably be investigated, in fact, you should be by the California Attorney General and other authorities to see if you should start refunding that money. It's pathetic. It's just pathetic how you failed your obligations to your customers. Any other comment? All right. So well, I'd like to respond to one, one of the comments. Sure. And I have heard the comments. Um, Many times. Yeah. <laughs> Every meeting. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I would like to say yes, of course, we had discussions about um, meet the possibility in the future of, of um, doing things remotely to reduce the, the travel costs. And, but I, I want to point out part of the contract on page 83.7.8 uh, Best, Best, and Krieger are only billing for one way travel with a maximum of two hours. And so that to me mm -hmm. uh, was key. Just driving from my house to here could be one hour. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> but I, I just know. wanted to make that comment. Okay, thank you. All right, um, any motions? I move to accept. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great, motion carries unanimously. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, I was wondering if I could just make a brief. Uh, you betcha. Yeah. Uh, just on behalf of BBK, um, Sam Chan and I just wanted to say how excited we are for this 
this opportunity um, to work with you, the board, um, Mr. Duncan and, and his staff. Um, and while we know we have very big shoes to fill, uh, we're very excited to get to work. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, let's see now, item 6.4, annual election of vice president. Do you want me to do a quick intro or do you? I think you got it. I, does anyone have questions on the on the routine? I don't. <laughs> I just want to say that um, I want to thank uh, Tom for being the president and, and Bruce for being the vice president. I personally am too busy with my, my work to, to take on the vice president role. Um, and I'm, I'd like to see um, some of the newer directors Taken on, and I'd like to to know. Do you want nominations or how? Do you, yeah. Sure. I'd like to um, nominate Rochelle for the vice president. I would like to nominate Tom for the vice president. Okay. So we got two nominations. We need a second for one of them. I'll second my own, so we can vote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I will. Okay, I'll second Rochelle. Okay. So let's vote on um, let's vote on on mine. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. And then um, for Rochelle. Favor. All in favor? Just second or I mean I Okay. So Rochelle, you'll be vice president. Okay. Second. Thank you. Um, we'll go on We're and the next meeting is when we'll start that. Okay, and oh, that's great. Second one in December, right? Because we're right. skipping the first one. Right. It'll be the second meeting in December that the the new configuration will will start oh, off that way. Right. Oh, okay. And the next one is the scope of work for um, the O'Neill Ranch. You're welcome to come up here if you want, Taj, or if you like. I anticipate this being a long one. Um, I think we've been briefing the board um, over the last year or two on the ammonia challenges that uh, the O'Neill well has given us. You know, we've reached the end of staff's ability, and so we are reaching out to get some support, and we did interview and uh, solicit statements of qualifications, and we are recommending that we en engage Corona Environmental Consulting uh, to help evaluate what we've done so far, to see if we haven't missed anything, uh, you know, the low-hanging fruit, but then also to uh, do an alternatives assessment for what might be coming if we're out of options, easy options. Um, they bring a lot of treatment uh, ideas, and we've worked with this group before for Chrome 6, and um, it was a an easy decision for the selection group to make this recommendation to the board. So with that, I, I am answering any questions if you have any. Any questions? I mean, they're a very good, sure, good group. Highly uh, that we've qualified. Yes. All right. Okay, so no questions and I'll, uh, any, any public comment on this item? Thank you, um, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, when I had recently attended one of your standing committee meetings and this issue was discussed, I brought up the idea that instead of um, continuing to dump a bunch of money <laughs> into trying to make the water that you want to pump out usable, why not just use this well as uh, in cooperation with the city as an ASR well, injection well, and let it uh, let it help the groundwater levels by not not only by not pumping from it, but also by actively injecting into it at that point. It's near the Belts Well field. It seems like a logical spot that uh, could be a source of uh, cooperation between you and the city of Santa Cruz. And I've, I've watched this district um, struggle with what to do with this problem. And maybe 
there is a solution, but it will be so expensive that it will be um, cost prohibitive, really, for the amount of water that you would, you, you would get for it or that you would want to pump from it in that area. So I would like you to consider that idea, to instead of uh, dumping more water, <laughs> sorry, more money into trying to make the water that you want to pump from this well potable, instead just dedicate it as an ASR injection well and study the impacts of that on the groundwater levels that we all are worried about. Thank you. Any other comment on this item? Okay, seeing none. Um, entertain a motion. There's two motions. So operating contingency fund. And yes, I'll move both motions. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Awesome. Thank you. And then let's see. We've got um, six, Tracy. Six. Uh, thank you. Hi. Good evening, board. I have an informational item for you tonight. Um, as I've reported in a couple of. Uh, uh, recent board meetings, the district has been exploring a, a reorganization concept that I wanted to present to you tonight in our operations and maintenance department. Um, I really wanna thank Ron Duncan for always challenging us to um, think about new alternatives and uh, develop efficiencies within our staffing, uh, not only for our current needs, but also looking out for our future. Um, in taking a look at some of our recent recruitments, um, we've recognized that we had um, we have some areas where we could spend a little bit more time in developing some leadership and um, as my memo presents tonight the operations and maintenance department has been piloting for the last couple of months um, a, a concept for um, with a one management structure excuse me one supervisory structure um, as opposed to a two supervisor structure that we have had for a number of years so over the last couple of months, we've really had a, um, a, a great opportunity um, for management staff to work very closely with our line staff in developing some of those opportunities and seeing some ways that we can develop some um, efficiencies within the organization and especially in that department. Um, thanks to Christine and Troy Adams and especially their staff for being open to exploring this kind of change and really looking at ways that they can, can work better and smarter and hopefully um, develop those leadership skills that we hope to take advantage of in the future. Um, the concept is, uh, the pilot concept is kind of run its course and we will be bringing an item forward in the December meeting um, to take a look at from a restructure standpoint. We've got some work to do with our employee groups in the meantime and continue our um, level of conversation. But because of this change, I thought we would bring it to the board tonight as an informational item. Um, we are not proposing at this time to increase the number of FTE. Um, but we're looking at, at moving things around and developing those lead um, positions differently and um, maybe adding a staff at the water distribution level so we can provide more backup when we need it. Any questions? Mm -hmm. That was actually, oh, go ahead first. Um, yes, uh, I'm, one thing I'm a little bit confused with and maybe concerned about is you have two water distribution leads and question. all of the water distribution sections report to both of them. So. I mean, that sounds like an, a, a situation where it could be really confusing because yeah. someone no. tells you to go left, someone tells you to <laughs> go right. That's actually our current model, and that has been our model for a number of years. And the reason that particular um, uh, work unit has two leads is because that's our construction and maintenance crew. And so they're deployed out in, um, they're not always deployed together. And so making sure that we have um, the, the folks out where we need them to be and dealing with the types of, of uh, work that we're doing out in the field, um, that particular crew is out at different sites all the time. Um, what we're trying to do is enhance the duties and responsibilities so that it's not just providing lead work in the field, which is how it has been, but actually bringing some of that level of responsibility back into some administrative duties so that there is an opportunity for them to develop those types of skills um, that we haven't really taken advantage of um, over a number of years. So that's our current structure. Um, that one is not, we're not interested in changing that because it does work well for the types of deployment that we have out in our, our field. 
Um, what we would be doing is adding a lead to the operations crew, which currently does not have a lead position. Um, again, to try and provide some um, leadership uh, development and to provide some offsetting um, uh, responsibilities um, from the supervisory role. So it really kind of creates that, that, that team flow. Um, when we have a supervisor who is out, um, because we only have one now, um, then it also gives oppor multiple opportunities for folks within the, that, that work group or those work groups to actually work in um, the supervisory capacity and out of class role um, and again develop those leadership opportunities. So the two um, water distribution leads is our current staffing pattern. Well, if it works for you, I guess well, so. Yeah, it does. Can I, can I rephrase it? So, because we've been working a lot on this. There used to be two people not quite at this level. So what we heard when we, when s what staff came and told us was we need another person over here. So the two people up here were consolidated in one. These people all take on a little bit more responsibility, but by the consolidation, we gain another person down here. And so that's what we heard was needed from staff and it, is that fair, is that a fair way to describe it? Yep, that, okay. that was part of the dilemma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, by listening to the staff, incorporating that feedback, working with Tracy and Christine and Troy and the whole team, that's what, uh, and it seems to be working well. The trial period has been quite successful, so I don't know if that was helpful, but um, we, you know, we're very involved with it. Okay, <laughs> great. Any other questions? Okay, so I assume you'll bring that back when you're making a... Thank you. Okay, Tracy. Thanks a lot. Um, all right, so we're going to be going into closed session shortly, so um, if there's any comments regarding closed session, now would be the time. Thank you, my name is Becky Steinbruner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos, and I am the petitioner in the legal challenge that is still before you because I am not going to give up. Um, as you, I'm sure already know, and as Mr. Basso will tell you in closed session, Judge Small did deny my request to move the action out of this county. He did deny my request to amend my appeal. He did deny my request for continuance on the hearing date in order to get critical information from the state that has been withheld with uh, three delays in Public Records Act requests and he ultimately denied the writ of mandate. And I will appeal, and I am in the process of that doing now. Um, what I wanna say is that I, I hear that you've got a lot of money from the state today, and I'm sure, I mean, it's obvious you're all very happy about that, but what you're not looking at is the uh, things that you have overlooked <laughs> in the process, environmental things that you have overlooked. And that's really disheartening to me because I, I know you all care. But it seems like in the zeal to get this big pot of money that you've just been awarded today, you've overlooked a lot of things, including environmental concerns and if you e do end up building this, you're gonna have a really hard time. You're already having a hard time getting your encroachments permits. And your customers are having a hard time paying the bills that you have Im imposed upon them so that you could have a good picture to get this pot of money. And that is only reimbursable. So you're racing against the clock to get all the money spent Mr. Duncan's declaration has said the cutoff date is February 29th of 2020. At least that was in his declaration. So I, I understand the, the race here, but um, what I wanna say is that I, I feel a lot of people feel that you ha have not listened to your customers, you have not listened to the public in general, and you have overlooked some very, very serious environmental threats, both in what you hope to inject into the groundwater, how you have overlooked um, safeguards in real time, 
how you have not really consulted with the lead agencies to make the mitigations enforceable. But you haven't listened to the people. Thank you. Um, I think we had a thorough environmental review reviewed by an independent judicial body and we had the support of both the federal EPA and the state. So we are going now going to adjourn to a closed session. Our next meeting will not be until the third Thursday in December. Thank you. Tuesday? Hopefully Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Yeah. yeah.